You are listening to the International Radio Report. Your reactions are much appreciated. Feel free to send them to Radio Report at Yahoo.com. That is Radio Report at Yahoo.com. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to the International Radio Report on CKUT 90.3 FM in Montreal. Our show for June the 27th, 2021. My name's Sheldon. I am here with Jill, and we thank you for joining us for 30 minutes of news and information about the world of radio. Uh, we thank you for tuning in. You can uh, contact us if you wish. Uh, questions, comments, suggestions. Our email address is radioreport at yahoo.com. You can listen to us live streaming or archived at ckut.ca, the website for uh, CKUT Radio here in Montreal. And our Facebook group is called International Radio Report. We welcome Stefan and Dale, two new members joining us this week. And our YouTube channel, which you can find at youtube.com slash international radio report. We have uh, 371 subscribers there now. You can find our show uh, posted up there each week within an hour or so after the live broadcast airs on Sunday mornings. So uh, lots of opportunities for you to uh, access our show, and you can go back and listen to older shows there as well as some uh, special editions of the program that are only available exclusively on the YouTube channel. So we have a number of different stories from a number of different places around the planet today, so we'll get things going with a local story uh, from our CBC uh, domestic uh, service here in Montreal on 88.5 FM. And this comes from Steve Faggy of the Fagstein blog here in Montreal. Steve is also a reporter, uh, writer at the Montreal Gazette. Uh, his headline is CBC Cancels Daybreak's Taste Test Music Column. This is a, a weekly feature on the morning show, the weekday morning show on uh, 88.5, where um, Brendan Kelly, who's also a columnist at the Montreal Gazette, introduces the audience to new music, um, all different genres, all different artists. Anyways, uh, Brendan Kelly uh, will get to sleep in now on Wednesdays, his weekly taste test column in which he introduces Daybreak listeners to new music, has been cancelled after many years, effective immediately. Neither Kelly nor the CBC offered any comment on this news when Steve asked them about it, and neither would confirm nor deny it explicitly. Steve did manage to get an update. After he posted his story, Brendan Kelly confirmed the news on a Twitter posting. He says, quote, I can confirm that I was told earlier this week my taste test column on CBC Radio's Daybreak has been cut. They say they'll get their music elsewhere. I've been doing this for years and years, so I'd just like to thank all the faithful listeners who tuned in and texted in. And that's on uh, his uh, Twitter uh, feed at Brendan Showbiz. Um, This is a really strange story. We talked about the ratings a couple weeks back in Montreal, and uh, CBC Montreal is climbing up the ratings. And uh, they only have a couple local shows. They have their uh, Daybreak show, they have a Radio Noon show, and they have a Home Run Drive Home show. Yet they're creeping up closing in on Virgin Radio, one of the FM music stations in Montreal. Uh, This is something new for CBC. They normally don't do well in Montreal, but their CBC Radio 1 in English has been inching its way up the ratings. This is a very popular feature, and I don't think anybody really understands, probably Brendan himself, as to why they pulled the plug on it now of all times when you know, we keep seeing weird things going on in radio, and I guess this is just another one of those uh, unexplained uh, decisions. I mean, this is a really different type of feature. Like, he, what he does each week is he takes a, a new release, a new album, and he, he will alternate quite often. Uh, sometimes he'll play a, a Quebec-based French uh, artist. Then he'll play some international artist the next week, and then a local artist the following week. And they take it's very interactive. They get comments from the rest of the morning crew on the music that he plays. Uh, They take a lot of text messages. You know, they really want people to react. You know, how do you like this new record? I I don't know. It seems to be one of the really popular features on the program, and now it's gone. And and as you say, they'll get their music elsewhere. Well, what are they going to do? 
you know, they don't play a lot of music on the program. It's not a, a music station. It's more or less a news talk station. Uh, so this is a, a kind of a neat little feature to run once a week. And, and hey, it's only once a week yeah. besides it. You know, it's yeah. not like the, they can't be paying the guy a lot of money for this. So I don't think it's a financial thing. But um, anyways, uh, it's kind of a sad story. And uh, I'm not sure. Uh, at least Brendan's got a number of outlets, you know, to, to reach the public and other, other media. But uh, this is one that I think a lot of people will miss. So there's some big news uh, these days of declined shortwave. There's a return of a Canadian station on the air. No, not Radio Canada International. Sorry. I don't want to put your hopes up. Uh, this is a story by uh, Dan Robinson via the shortwave listening post. It is rare, not super rare, that we get any good news these days about shortwave broadcasting. Remember the excitement a few years ago when Guinea returned to shortwave? Then Nigeria returned, but that has kind of uh, become intermittent now. A station has returned to shortwave, one of the stations that was absent for some time, CFVP. The low-power relay of 1060 kHz AM in Calgary, Alberta, returned to 6030 kHz with the help of amateur radio operators. The station had been off the air through 2019. The last time it was reported was in late 2018 when it was relaying CKMX 1060 AM in Calgary. According to a note posted on the World of Radio Group, two engineers from Bell Media, Dale and Jerry, who are also hams, VA6AD and V6QCT, respectively, rebuild the transmitter, partially with ham radio parts, and repair the connection to the antenna with a temporary matching network. The temporary matching network means that not all of the 100 watts are going into the antenna. According to Harold Sellers, who is acting as EQSL manager for the reactivated shortwave station, CFVP6030 went back on the air and he was not able to hear it until later on June 19th. Best reception was via SDR sites in southern Alberta, northern Montana, Idaho, and up in Edmonton, Alberta. Programming consists of straight comedy routines from Funny 1060 AM, the Calgary station that carries old recordings of stand-up comedians with local IDs and ads mixed in every few minutes. So I was able to actually hear it uh, via the Lamont Alberta uh, SDR, the V6JY uh, SDR. It came in very well for about an hour, and then it faded out. But uh, it's easy to recognize that you're listening to the station. I mean, there's not a lot of comedy routines on shortwave in general. Uh, <laughs> so this is low power, 100 watts. It's going to be a tough one. And one of the biggest problems here in North America Radio Marti is on 6030 all evening, and that one is a powerhouse, so it's uh, difficult for a lot of people to actually receive it. I think the best uh, is to try late afternoon before Radio Marti gets on, but honestly, mostly with uh, local SDRs around the Alberta area. Yeah, how, I'm not sure how long is Marti on 6030, because I, uh, possibly very early morning might be a good shot to, to try for the uh, the Calgary station. From 0 to zero 05, and then from twelve ten to 12 UT. Okay, so maybe in that opening between uh, their two transmissions of Radio Marti, that might be a good time to give it a shot as well. So after 05, I'm, that's that's interesting. It's 1 a.m. here in the East Coast. I, I'm going to try that one at, after 05. Actually, on Monday, it goes to 05. Every other day, it goes to 04. Okay. So midnight Eastern, Radio Marti signs off. The other problem that could arise from this is the famous Cuban jamming of Marti that often is not never turned off. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That that could be another issue. But, um, it, you know, it's fun to get a new DX target. Yep. And this is certainly a DX target, I mean, with very oh, low yeah, power. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, uh, what's what's good though is very unique programming. So it is going to stand out if you absolutely you know if you hear comedy routines and a bunch of laughter and what have you. Uh, it's you know you're going to be pretty sure that you've got the right station, that yeah. the right signal coming through. I, I was reading something else about this station re being reactivated, and 
I, there are there are a number of stations using this comedy format. I know yeah. not just Cal, the Calgary station, but there's some U.S. stations on 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 medium wave uh, using this uh, format. So kind of an odd one, but anyways, uh, you know the AM band has become that yeah. sort of uh, you know strange formats and uh, and what have you. So anyways, check it out. It's six zero three zero kilohertz. And their call letters uh, CFVP. We have uh, Canada Day coming up. Canada's National Day is coming up on July the first, and uh, we've got news from Bill Tilford via Glenn Hauser's World of Radio. A special broadcast coming up, uh, marking the occasion. July 1st from 10 to 11 p.m. Eastern Daylight, which is July 2nd 02 to 03 UTC. WBCQ The Planet on 6160 and 7490 will be airing a special called Canada Day, but the day is spelled D apostrophe (laughs) E-H, sort of a playoff on what other people say Canadians say all the time, eh? eh? (laughs) So Canada Day broadcast. July 1st is Canada Day, and since RCI is no longer blessing shortwave listeners with its presence on the shortwaves, Fred Waterer, a genuine Canadian, and Uncle Bill Tilford, an American who is frequently mistaken for one, will present Canada Day, an affectionate salute to the occasion with music, humor, fun facts, and stories on WBCQ The Planet, which is right next door to Canada, up in northern Maine, with time donated by Angela and Alan Weiner, the owners of WBCQ. So that's kind of neat. It's a, uh, yep. I don't, I don't remember anybody having done this before, paying tribute to Canada. That's cool. Uh, so that is nice. Again, uh, July 1st, uh, 10 to 11 p.m. Eastern, which is July 2nd, 02 to 03. And the frequencies 6160 and 7490 kilohertz for the Canada Day broadcast. Two frequencies that usually are pretty good. And you'll hear everything from A to Z. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, the uh, famous Woodpecker is now a cultural heritage site, and this is via the Southgate Amateur Radio News. From the 1970s until the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, the Soviets' over-the-horizon radar Woodpecker caused severe interference in the amateur radio bands, and on shortwave international broadcast bands also. A article on Vice says that Ukraine has declared that the enormous Duga-1 radar array is a protected cultural monument, almost 2,300 feet long and 450 feet high, the steel beams of the radar tower over the surrounding forest. From a distance, it appears to be a massive wall or the start of a cage. The Association of Chernobyl Tour Operators first announced that Ukraine had made Duga-1 a protected heritage site on its Facebook page. Interfax, a Russian news service, later reported the official designation. Our heritage is not only the area around the power plant, but also the buildings located on its territory. Oleksandr Kachenko, Ukraine Ministers of Cultural and Information Policy, said in a telegram, tread about the announcement. So now we are working on identifying other objects that should be part of the list of monuments. Our goal is to prevent destruction when possible. When Duga-1 came online sometimes in the mid-70s, radio operators around the world noticed a strange signal coming from the forests of Ukraine. The system was so powerful, it dis- disrupted some frequencies with an irritating thumping noise. Amateur radio operators dubbed the signal's source the Russian woodpecker. Because of the repeated tapping noise, it is pumped into ham radios. And uh, that was something uh, very, very present on shortwave. I remember when I started, the woodpecker, would you would hear that everywhere. And um, there's, by the way, an equivalent today, but it is not related to this system. It's a brand new system that Russia has now. But this is cool to see that they want to preserve part of shortwave history, basically, with the uh, Russian woodpecker site. Yeah, there are some videos you can check out on site of some people who've actually gone to the uh, Duga One yep. site and and climbed up the towers and taken some really impressive shots and video from there. 
Um, it is uh, very close to Chernobyl, though, so it's <laughs> it's uh, I, it, it's kind of funny. The Association of Chernobyl Tour Operators. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, you know, when they threw that thing together, uh, because it's been a long time since uh, you know they've wanted did not want people going to that area. But it is becoming kind of one of these uh, quirky little places that people want to visit. So yeah, I would I would be one of them. I, I would like to go there and and see what it's like. It's, no. uh, it's a lot of fun i'm sure it's a lot of fun to see all that and it must be very impressive i would think so yeah so what's happening with the sun well nothing much this week it was very quiet there was a sunspot group 2833 that is rotating out of view pretty much it's stable no strong flares no real geomagnetic storm it was rather quiet and uh, solar flux hovered between about 75 and 80 all week so quiet conditions uh it's Summer propagation now. Midday is probably the worst part of the day to listen to shortwave. You're better off in later in the afternoon, evening, and night. And, uh, well, what's coming up for the week ahead? Uh, nothing really significant showing up. Another quiet week. So the best thing to do is uh, turn on that radio and listen. Our next story takes us to, well, the, the story itself, some people may wonder, well, why are you talking about this on a program about radio. Well, we'll get to the radio part of it in a, in a couple minutes. Um, there's a definite connection to radio here with this story. The headline from AP News via Glenn Hauser and World of Radio is U.S. takes down Iran-linked news sites, alleges disinformation. The story is out of uh, Dubai, uh, Associated Press. American authorities seized a range of Iran state-linked news website domains they accused of spreading disinformation, the U.S. Justice Department said Tuesday, a move that appeared to be a far-reaching crackdown on Iranian media amid heightened tensions between the two countries. The Justice Department said 33 of the seized websites were used by the Iranian Islamic Radio and Television Union, which was singled out by the U.S. government last October for what officials described as efforts to spread disinformation and sow discord among American voters ahead of the 2020 presidential election. The U.S. said that three other seized websites were operated by the Iraqi Shiite paramilitary group Katayb Hezbollah, which more, more than a decade ago was designated a foreign terrorist organization. The group is separate from the Lebanese militant Hezbollah group, whose news websites remain operational. The website domains are owned by U.S. companies, but despite the sanctions, neither the IRTVU nor KH obtained the required licenses from the U.S. government before using the domain names, according to the Justice Department. The department's announcement came hours after the Iranian state-run news agency IRNA revealed the U.S. government's seizure without providing further information. On Tuesday, visiting the addresses of a handful of sites, including Iran State Television's English-language arm Press TV, Yemeni Houthi-run Al Masara Satellite News Channel, and Iranian State TV's Arabic-language channel Al Alam, produced a federal takedown notice. It said the websites were seized as part of law enforcement action by the U.S. Bureau of, In of Industry and Security, Office of Export Enforcement, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The U.S. government also took over the domain names of news website Palestine Today, which reflects the views of Gaza-based Islamic militant groups Hamas and Islamic Jihad, redirecting the site to the same takedown notice. Press TV, launched in June 2007, is the state-run Islamic Republic of Iran Broadcasting's English language service. Its Iran-based website, PressTV.ir, was not affected. Most of the domains seized appeared to be uh, .net, .com, and .tv domains. The first two are generic top-level domains, uh, while TV is owned by the Pacific Island nation of Tuvalu, but administered by the U.S. company Verisign. Seizing a domain of a major country-specific top-level domain, such as Iran's .ir, would be apt to produce widespread international condemnation as a violation of sovereignty. 
This isn't the first time that the U.S. has seized domain names of sites it excuses of spreading disinformation. Last October, the Department of Justice announced the takedown of nearly 100 websites linked to Iran's powerful Revolutionary Guard. The U.S. said the sites operating under the guise of genuine news outlets were waging a global disinformation campaign to influence U.S. policy and push Iranian propagation around the world. There are no private television or radio stations in Iran. Satellite dishes, while widespread, are also illegal. So that leaves the IRIB with a monopoly on the domestic airwaves. And there is the radio connection. Yep. One of the biggest problems with this, of course, is when you start censoring the internet, removing what you don't want to see. At the other end, of course, in a country where everything is controlled by the government, why uh, radio is important. Shortwave radio has no boundaries. It cannot be simply uh, deleted from the internet. It's a radio signal. And so both sides here, to understand that shortwave radio is really nice for information, the country of Iran, the population of Iran, through BBC, through Radio France, through all the different shortwave outlets, can actually get other news than what the government is actually giving them. The fine line here, and what's making it difficult, is, first of all, what is truth? And and that's a very difficult thing, depending on what nation you are. And the other thing with that is um, anything can be taken down. So radio is important here because that signal is going to go through and it's not going to be taken down. It's also important for the people in the country of Iran as yep. well. You know, they're, if they're outlying, outlying satellite dishes and, and the internet is being controlled with very simple portable shortwave radios that are very inconspicuous that people can use, you know, in the safety of their own homes, they would have the ability to tune into foreign broadcasts uh, targeting them in Iran, yeah. for example. You know, they say that you can listen to both sides of the story and the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Yeah, absolutely. So to be able to hear both sides, the same for us, you know, it would yeah. be really nice for us to hear the broadcast, what is coming out of a country like Iran, listen to what's coming out of the United States, for example, listening to what's coming from neutral countries, yep. and try and find the middle ground somewhere. Uh, without these shortwave broadcasts, what do those people have available to them? What do we have available to us? I think the governments, uh, you know, the decision makers that have shut down so many of these international services are doing a, a huge disservice to not themselves, only themselves, but the population of yep. the world as well. Yep. Uh, so, I, you know, a story like this is really important to look at and realize what's going on out there. And again, you know, of how fortunate so many of us are to have access to everything. Yeah. But there are as many, if not more people around the world who don't have that luxury. Absolutely. And uh, without those radio broadcasts, they're really missing out on a lot of options that were available to them in the past that just aren't there anymore. There was a perfect example last week when we talked about that clandestine station. There are clandestine shortwave stations that pop up here and there to target certain communities in, in Iran or in the, you know, in the Persian Gulf area. And so each one has their own, um, you know, voice, its, its own things to say. But even us, how many times over, I'm, I can tell you, so many times over the last 40 years of shortwave listening, I have found that it was interesting to have the viewpoint of others about events even happening in Canada. Definitely, yeah. Um, you you just need more more sources of information and and to be able to balance them out and and yep. you know discount the ones that you know just you know are are way overboard or way off the scale uh, and then try to find the counterbalance somewhere else Absolutely. Um, if you're limit it's like if you only had one TV station to watch yep. you know I mean you, you just you know uh, it just wouldn't work you know you wouldn't be happy with that so in more important things like finding out what's going on you know even even Iran to listen to what other broadcasters, the countries, are saying about them. 
them. Yeah. I remember in the days of uh, the Cold War, you know, leaders of, of the Soviet bloc countries were reported as listening to shortwave to hear what's the voice of America saying about us? What's the BBC saying Absolutely. about us? You know, this happened all the time. Gorbachev in, 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 uh, in Russia was a, an avid shortwave listener. Uh, because he wanted to hear what others were saying about him, not just what his own country was saying. Mm. So, you know, those days are dwindling. Those sources of, of information like that are, are disappearing every day. And it's it's really kind of sad. And then when you see this type of story where where they might be able to get alternative information, sites being shut down and what have you, uh, that gate gatekeeper comes into play that word uh, that's so important and and so uh disturbing in some cases knowing that if some people just want to shut things down and block you from hearing them or looking at them they can very easily do it and it's your yeah. voice it's your unique voice of who you are in the world you know that's it with shortwave broadcasting over the years we've been able to learn so much about so many different parts of the world that often never get talked about in you know in local national yep. or domestic broadcasting of any kind or in our newspapers or what have you i think shortwave listeners in general were a little bit more world savvy of things going I on out there so. you know and and that's kind of sad to have lost uh, a lot of that access uh, sure we have the internet but you know it's not necessarily the same thing yeah it's time for the ham radio contests Yes, and we'll start things off with Canada Day once again, coming up for the second time in our program today. And it is the Radio Amateurs of Canada annual event called the RAC Canada Day Contest. It's the full day, uh, 0 to 2359, July the 1st. Uh, that's the Zulu times, uh, UTC times. Each year on July 1st, the anniversary of Canada's Confederation, Radio Amateurs of Canada sponsors the RAC Canada Day contest, and amateurs all over the world are invited to celebrate Canada's birthday party on the air. So it's on all the major bands, uh, 160 through all the way through two meters. So six meters and two meters involved as well. It's CW and phone. Uh, you can do it in SSB, in FM mode, AM mode, uh, whatever you like. And uh, there are suggested frequencies for the CW, 25 kilohertz up from the edge uh, of the bands. And for SSB, uh, they give a bunch of recommended frequencies. Uh, check for CW activity on the half hour. And interesting, uh, it is a contest. You can accumulate points. But what's really neat is during the contest, uh, each province's official Radio Amateurs of Canada station is on the air. So uh, VA3, RAC, they all end in RAC. So yep. you can go looking for them, try to get them from all provinces and all territories. And each of those, if you're in the contest, is worth an extra 10 points. So 20 points for every time you either contact or if you're a shortwave listener, if you hear the VA or the VE RAC stations. Yeah. Um, you can even get special certificates for those as well. So uh, we'll put all the details of this contest uh, up in a link on our Facebook page for you. It's a lot of fun. I've participated oh, in the contest uh, many times over the years, and uh, it's neat to hear all parts of Canada on the bands. It's a lot of fun for uh, radio listeners also. There's the DLDX RTTY contests, 11 Zulu, July 3rd to 1059 Zulu, July 4th, sponsored and organized by the German DX RTTY contest group. The mode is RTTY only, and all bands, 3.5 to 30 megahertz, excluding 10, 18, and 24 megahertz. And finally, we have the Marconi Memorial HF contest, sponsored by the Italian Amateur Radio Association. 1400 Zulu July 3rd to 1400 Zulu July 4th. The Marconi Memorial Contest HF commemorates the second century of radio and its father, Marconi. It's a worldwide competition. Everybody can work everybody. 
but the mode is CW only. It is 10 meters through 160 meters, uh, except the work bands. It is the end. We thank you for tuning in. Uh, we'll be back again next uh, Sunday with another 30 minutes of news and information. If you have anything you want to share with us, uh, uh, stories you might want to pass along to us, we always appreciate your input. Either email radioreport at yahoo.com or join our Facebook group, uh, International Radio Report, where you can post up your comments and messages and stories there for us. And, of course, our YouTube channel is available at International Radio Report. Have a great week, everyone, and we will talk to you again next week. Happy Canada Day to all our Canadian listeners out there.